2021 to Maxwell Conversations, which features conversations with high profile international arbitration lawyers on topics in international arbitration and challenges assumptions with a deeper examination of the issues. In this first conversation, my guest is ICA President Lucy Reed, widely regarded to be one of the titans in both investment treaty as well as international commercial arbitration, with whom I will speak about the right to a physical hearing. We will later be joined by two other guests, Yasmin Lachlu and Qian Pao, as we go more deeply into ICA's work and the sense of a physical hearing in regional arbitration. Lucy, good morning. Good morning. Good early morning to you. I'd like to start off uh, our conversation uh, by um, recounting uh, in, in minute form your career. Uh, you started as a law clerk, you then worked in the US State Department, you then became general counsel and then on to private practice, eventually heading the global arbitration practice of a multinational law firm. You're now an independent arbitrator and you also teach arbitration. Perhaps um, you could tell us what has occupied your time recently. Sure, let me start by thanking you um, for the kind introduction and saying hello, I hope, to some of my friends in Maxwell Chambers and Singapore, uh, whom I miss a great deal. Well, I left uh, Singapore and National University of Singapore in December of 2019 after about eight years in Asia. And I was looking forward to life back in New York City uh, and in New England. Uh, but of course, with the pandemic, that was not meant to be. And so I can say with, with gratitude that no one in my uh, group of family or friends uh, has been sick. I have taken advantage of the time to catch up on several arbitral awards that were overdue when I left Singapore because I extended an extra semester. So I, for the first time, had a backlog. So like most of you, I'm sitting in front of my screen uh, working with words or with pictures of people and arbitrating um, full time. I have a practice, I have a rule, which I've written about, some of you know, that I have take on no more than 10 to 15 cases at a time, balance between investor state and commercial arbitration so that I can, so that I can keep up. Now, I also invest substantial time every day, actually. The first thing I do every workday is do pro um, my tasks as a vice president of the SEAC court. Uh, that's appointing arbitrators, dealing with consolidation, joinder, expedited procedure, emergency arbitrators, sometimes challenges. Uh, so that's first, first in the morning, my time. And then being ICA president has taken a fair amount of time working on projects. And, and as you know, spending a lot of time uh, postponing repeatedly the next Congress, which now will be in Edinburgh in September 2022. Uh, which is over two years after it was originally scheduled. I'm not teaching, Lawrence, but I'm doing an intensive course at NUS in February and one at Sciences Po in Paris in the spring. So I stay out of trouble, let's put it that way. That's great. I, I, I'm sure uh, your courses will be oversubscribed, but coming to our, our topic, uh, one question that I had for you is, is, is to trace uh, a little bit uh, from a historical point of view, uh, what you see to be the stage uh, in the history of international arbitration that there first began a developed international sense of a right to be heard. We might all have our own uh, domestic views of a right to be heard, but when, when did the international community have this sense that a right to be heard was important? I'm glad that you asked that question because it prompted me to look backwards and, and examine that question. Because like most of us who are sitting as arbitrator or advocates during the pandemic, we've tend to be preoccupied with how to manage the hearing and how fairly to hear people uh, on screen and remotely, uh, which is an unexamined uh, practical approach. So this gave me, as I say, the opportunity to look back 
at why we have hearings and with, without answering just because, just because that's how we do it. That's how we have to do it. So I could take you back actually to the 12 tables codifying Roman law that was back in 450 BC or to the Magna Carta uh, in 1215. AD, but I, I don't think that's very practical um, and people don't really want to hear it. So I would look at the 1927 Geneva Conventions and of course the 1958 New York Convention. And if you do look at the Geneva Convention, Article 2B, and I have it written down here, uh, it says a court is to refuse enforcement of an arbitral award if the party facing enforcement, quote, was not given notice of the arbitration proceedings in sufficient time to allow him, that's at her, to present his or her case. So that phrase uh, in Geneva is presenting your case. It's a notice provision. But then when we get to 1958 and the New York Convention, Article 5.1b keeps the idea of notice, but it gives uh, a separate uh, stage, I would say, to the right to be heard. Article 5.1b, most of us can recite it, um, but I'll read it, permits a court not to recognize an award uh, if the party facing recognition of the award, and I quote, was not given proper notice of the appointment of the arbitrator or of the arbitration proceedings or was otherwise, otherwise unable to present his case. Uh, it's well accepted, and you, you can read about it um, very easily in Gary Bourne or Maxie Shear, that the right to be heard, coupled, coupled, it's important, coupled with equal treatment, the equal treatment of uh, the, the parties, that those are the principles that underlie the very legitimacy uh, of arbitration. And the right to be heard, we can come back to what that means, the right to be heard is one of the few mandatory procedural requirements across really all jurisdictions um, that can limit the party's freedom to, uh, to um, design their own arbitral um, procedure. And I, I think it's, uh, this, your questions, Lawrence, made me go back and reread my own Freshfields lecture from 2016. And that led me to look back at this idea of the early concern about parties not having known, not having had notice of the case. And we think that that's sort of silly now, because how could you not get notice of the case? Because we get notice through the mail, we get notice by courier, we get notice online, we get notice everywhere. But in historic times, it was actually very difficult to make sure that the parties knew that an arbitration proceeding was going on and knew that the arbitrators had been appointed. And the, the fact is that now with technology, notice is not an issue for us anymore. And I think we're in the same phase now with hearings. We're changing the way we're thinking about the right to present your case and the right to be heard because of the advances uh, in technology. So we're in, the, we're in the early 20th century with the Geneva Convention in 1927. And of course, I think that the war intervened only for the arbitral community to, to pick up again after the war and with the New York Convention in 1958. So during this period of time, kind of, you know, early to, to the late second half of the, of, of the 20th century, how much was the right to be heard associated with a right to be heard orally? And how much of it was associated with a right to be heard in writing, do you think? Well, interestingly, I could not find much, really no, no data from those years about how many hearings were oral uh, or in writing. I think the assumption, the, the safe assumption we can make is that a very high proportion of proceedings were heard orally with perhaps a written stage or maybe always uh, a written stage in advance in international arbitration. And the, the reasons for that assumption, I, I thought of three different things uh, to support that assumption. One is if you, we think about the right to be heard as a basic due process right, and we look at all the iterations of that, you, you find very little specific about whether the right to be heard is going to be written or oral or limitations to oral. 
So that's, it's not tied usually to written oral. The second key point is that many, maybe most national laws and institution rules go beyond the abstract right to be heard. They don't use that language from the conventions. We were just talking about the right to be heard and they talk about a party's right to a hearing. Um, so the question becomes the hard one of what is a hearing? UNSATRAL rule 17.3 says that if any party requests a hearing, there'll be a hearing. Even if the other party doesn't want one, even if the arbitrators don't want to get on a plane, there will be a hearing if requested. The SEAC approach, it's rule, I think, right, 24.1, specifies, in these words, specifies that unless the parties agree on a documents only arbitration, in other words, written submissions and written evidence, the tribunal and a party requests a hearing, the tribunal, and I quote, must hold a hearing for what? For what? For the presentation of evidence and or oral submissions, oral submissions on the merits and jurisdiction. Uh, so there we have the idea that a party that wants to be heard orally will be heard uh, orally. Now, the third key point, uh, and this is, it's, I'll take you back in time if you don't mind, since the ancient Greeks, the fact is the concept of a hearing has in practice been synonymous with an oral hearing, a, and specifically a physically physically in-person oral hearing. And that's despite the fact that we all had access to writing and the majority could have gone the way of written submissions and written presentations, but it hasn't, it's been oral. And my, my daughter, who's a classicist, was telling me that in ancient Greece, to have a case heard, you had to go to a specific hill uh, in Athens and be there with the opposing party to have the decider uh, decide your case with very little, if anything, uh, in writing. And, and the best person to write about this history is Ralston, uh, whose work on international arbitration from Athens to Locarno is, is very interesting. But we're not in Athens. <laughs> we're not in Athens anymore, and we're not on hills anymore, and technology uh, has advanced past that stage. And so I think the concept of what is an oral hearing uh, has to change as well. Unlike the Greeks, we have many ways to listen to each other. Uh, and, and hear each other other than physically being in person. And my last point, Lawrence, is I think it's probably, I'm not a psychologist and I'm wary of psychology and arbitration, but I think it's just a human trait to want to be listened to with the full attention of the, the fact finder uh, and the decision maker. You know, I'm glad you, I'm glad you raised uh, or you referred back to, to ancient Greece because it rather suggests that the physicality of a hearing or the, physic or, or the physical nature or the ph physical understanding of that right is not informed by say a, a civil law tradition or common law tradition, it goes much further back. Correct. Uh, I'm, I don't know, I don't wanna disappoint anyone, but I, I'm instantly wary of discussions of the differences between civil law tradition and common law traditional tradition in international arbitration. And that's because what we do, we have the privilege of doing something that really is a melding of some of the best parts of the civil law tradition, the written submissions, uh, and the best parts of the common law traditions, which is oral advocacy and uh, direct questioning of, of witnesses. And I, have, I, I don't wanna be a spoiler before Yasmin comes on, but in our ICA project on the right to a physical hearing, we saw differences in civil versus common law jurisdictions, but we didn't see any clear divide that, that said written versus some type of oral. And I, of course it's true, it's true that international arbitration uh, as we practice it focuses heavily on the physical hearing as the principal, or now the on-screen hearing, the physical opportunity for a party to present its case and challenge the evidence. That's the whole point of all this cross-examination, challenge the evidence seduced by the other party. And this sounds like common law, uh, of course, adversarial proceedings rather than the judge-led 
uh, investigative type proceedings that we see in civil law traditions. Um, so you might think, we might think that civil law lawyers would be more comfortable without a physical hearing and perhaps without a physical hearing, without a hearing at all, I should say. But I noticed that the recent Prague rules, which have been written to uh, give us a more streamlined view of international arbitration closer to the civil law tradition, envision a hearing. They don't, they don't talk about avoiding a hearing. They talk about streamlining the hearing and using telephonic or video means uh, to minimize travel costs. But the hearing is still embedded in the Prague rules. And I have to say, I've done this a long time and some of the best advocates and cross-examiners I know come from civil law countries and <laughs> some of the worst come from common law countries. Uh, and I, I should also say um, for civil lawyers who are listening who are new to this, that um, whether you know it or not, in the common law jurisdictions, we have a long history of um, documents only, arbitration. Uh, a couple examples, the AAA, the American Arbitration Association in the ICDR, expedited rules assume that any case valued at under 100,000 US dollars will be on documents only. Uh, you have to get over that presumption. The, Ingus, the, sorry, the English civil courts have used remote hearings for quite a while before the pandemic. And the LCI rules, I think back as early as 2014, expressly, expressly allow for remote oral hearings to take place by video or telephone conference. So sitting here in 2021, I don't see this as a common or civil law divide. The hard question in every case, and it's pretty much case by case now about whether a remote hearing uh, will equal the rights and equal treatment of a physical in-person hearing is a qualitative assessment of who's involved, access to hardware, access to software, timing and other issues. It's not civil versus common law. But I'll just mention as an anecdote, when I was teaching international arbitration at NUS, uh, the, I would start the class with they have the big blackboards across the front of the rooms in lecture rooms in law school. And I would take a piece of chalk and I would say, okay, over here at the very beginning is a dispute between the parties. And then I'd walk all the way across the classroom and get almost to the other end of the room. And I would put an X and I would say, here's the hearing. And then I'd keep going and I'd say, here's the award. Everything, the hearing, you all think about it as so romantic. We're gonna do cross-examination. It's gonna be intense. That's when the arbitrators will put their mind on the case. That is not true at all. Three quarters of the case are the written submissions, the preliminary sessions, the document production. The hearing tends to get, I think, too much attention sometimes. So sorry, that was more than civil common law. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. We, we we visited 1927. We visited 1958. Uh, let's let's go now a little bit later in the 20, 20th century to 1985, when the uh, the draftsmen of the model law were, were were putting pen to paper. With all that you've said, I mean, would you say it was likely that that you know they had this almost implied or innate sense of a physical hearing when when they refer to things like equal treatment and a full opportunity of presenting one's case? The short answer is yes. Uh, I have no doubt that's what they had in mind because that's all anybody had in mind in 1985. And you're right to use those phrases. It's Article 18 of the Model Law, which I always call you know, the holy grail of international arbitration. It's just one sentence long. And it says that the parties shall have equal treatment and the full opportunity to present. Uh, their cases in all stages, by the way, in all stages of the arbitration, not just the hearing. Um, I think it's important to remember that in 1985, video conferencing was almost science fiction. It was available, but I, I had a colleague do some research for me, and it turns out that to get a video con a conferencing console or whatever you would call it at that time cost $250,000. So I really don't think the model law drafters were thinking about it. Uh, I think Article 24 in the model law, I'm gonna come back to Article 18 for a reason, but Article 24 is in a sense uh, equally important because Article 24 
says that the tribunal, it starts out with sort of like, ah, the tribunal's all powerful. The tribunal can decide whether to have an oral hearing or proceed on the documents only. And then there's a full stop. And then it goes on to say, if a party, any party requests a hearing, such a hearing, meaning an oral hearing, then there has to be a hearing. So it's, it allows the parties to say to the arbitrators, whether you hate us or you're bored with us or you'd rather staying at home, uh, you're going to have to have a hearing, uh, an oral hearing at some point. I think that, um, I think it's important when you talk about the model law, as we often do, to remember it's meant to be flexible and not just flexible across jurisdictions, but also across time and technology. And now when we talk about a remote, well, now we do talk about remote and virtual hearings. And what we have in mind is what we're doing right here. We're, we're sitting in front of a screen, looking at each other, looking at each other and saying, gosh, she could look more awake or whatever. But we want, we want human contact, even if it is two-dimensional. And I predict a few years from now, and certainly a decade from now, we'll, we'll have different technologies. I think I've always said to Maxwell Chambers and other hearing venues, get the most advanced video conferencing. We'll have 3D technology, I know it. We'll, we'll have situations where we'll be able to feel as if a witness or an advocate is in the room with us if that person um, can't physically travel. But I want to, if, with your permission, Lawrence, I wanna go back to article 18 of the model law because thinking about this reminded me of the Freshfields lecture that I gave back in 2016. I should say the Queen Mary Freshfields lecture. And I, I called that the abuse, abuse of due process. And that required me to go back painstakingly through the travaux of the model law and the UNCTRA rules. I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, the UNCTRA rules and their amendments. And what I found was that over time, the drafters actually narrowed the due process language in the 2010 rules in Article 17. So at first, the UNCTRA, relevant UNCTRA rule that goes with Article 18 of the model law, at first it said that a party has a right to a full opportunity to present its case at any stage of the proceedings. But now in 2010, it says that a party has a reasonable, a re not full, a reasonable opportunity to present its case at an appropriate stage of the proceeding, meaning that what is due process changes at different stages of the proceeding. And I found this fascinating because what I learned was that, of course, the drafters weren't trying to diminish due process rights by changing full to reasonable, but to try to avoid the excessive reliance on made up or exaggerated due process complaints by the parties. And as relevant here, as relevant here, this travel would suggest that even though the model law still says you have a full opportunity to present your case, that doesn't include subject to certain national court requirements, which I think Yasmin will talk about, that doesn't include the right to say, I must have a physical in-person hearing uh, in any case involving the answer trial rules um, whenever it's safe which might be years from now, and a respondent can prevent a hearing from taking place for years and years, or that well, with climate change, for example, we won't be able to have more uh, attention given to when we should have physical hearings and when we shouldn't. There you go. I'll take you, I'll take you now to the, 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 the project itself, uh, which for the benefit of uh, our audience, I will say that in September, 2020, ICA launched a research pro project entitled, quote, does the right to a physical hearing exist in international arbitration, unquote. Could you tell us about what gave rise to the project, its usefulness and the status, the current status of the research project? I'm very happy to do that because it's probably the project under my ICA presidency, of which I'm most proud. And I had nothing to do with it, <laughs> almost nothing to do with it. Uh, so I'm taking no credit. Yasmin Lalu will be on in a minute, James Hosking and Professor Giacomo Rojas El Guata 
came to us at ICA and said they had this idea for this project and wouldn't the ICA report series be a good platform for publishing such, uh, such research? And I said, absolutely, do it yesterday, please. Because like many doing arbitrations, I, I recognize the urgent and really urgent demand for us to have reliable information, jurisdiction by jurisdiction about whether we could have remote hearings if the parties agreed, if the parties didn't agree, what were the standards for it uh, in national law? I would say in, in my ICA experience, it was a very rare need to know moment for ICA members. It's kind of like Achmea, uh, but more so. So if I recall correctly, I offered some guidance to them as editors, um, suggested that there be a template so that we didn't have a variety of reports covering different issues. And I also suggested, as I've learned in life, that they, the editors, prepare one report for one jurisdiction that with which they were satisfied to use as the model uh, to guide other rapporteurs and Yasmin and James practice in New York. So they, they did the US and it's a very thorough coverage uh, of the US jurisdiction. So fast forward, and it really was very fast uh, since September 2020, there are now 77 reports posted on a dedicated ICA website covering, of course, 77 jurisdictions for free use. You know, we, we published through Kluwer at ICA. We could have tried to get funds for this, but we thought it was too important a, a service for ICA members and others. So you can go online and read the reports. That's the first stage. The second stage is going to be a collection of essays. First, an essay or a paper, I would say, by the editors summarizing what they learned from the 77 jurisdictions and setting out the trends, civil common issues, di you know, different variations of uh, interpretation of the New York Convention, interpretations of the UNCTRA rules, and sort of more academic essays talking about uh, the kind of questions you pose to me. What is the theoretical and historical underpinning to a hearing? Uh, what is a hearing? What isn't a hearing? And that will be published in time, probably before now, for the Ed uh, Edinburgh Congress in September 2022. Um, it's, and, and I should put in, by the way, that the, the point that Yasmin and James and Giacomo, I don't know how many hours they spent editing those reports, which as always came in, you know, in varying qualities and completion to a absolute first rate standard. And I, we have huge, 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 huge number of hits on those reports at ICA. Um, so I'll, I, I won't be more of a spoiler. Um, we'll leave it to Yasmin to, to tell you some of the trends. Thank you. We are now joined, ladies and gentlemen, by two other guests. The first is Yasmin Lachlu, a partner and arbitration practitioner in the firm Shafetz Lindsay, and more pertinently, as Lucy has mentioned, one of the editors of the ICA project on the right to a physical hearing. The second is Qian Bao, an arbitrator with Arbitration Chambers, currently vice chair of the IBA's Arbitration Committee and vice president of the ICC Court of Arbitration. Welcome. Yasmin, in September 2020, uh, country reporters were provided a standard survey questionnaire asking whether a right to a physical hearing is expressly provided by or can be inferred from the arbitration law of a jurisdiction. They were asked what the impact of party autonomy was on tribunal powers to direct a non-physical hearing and whether remote hearings could affect enforceability. By May this year, 77 country reports have been received. Uh, do you, as an editor, see any trends, any commonalities uh, coming from the reports? Good afternoon, Lawrence. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to you, Lucy. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for this, for this introduction and uh, by you and by Lucy, by uh, such a warm and supportive uh, explanation. Of, of this project, which has, which has been uh, phenomenal to, to do, uh, a lot of work, but extraordinary reception from the practitioners 
and a great opportunity to meet remotely about 80, if not more, practitioners from around the world and to learn about them and to learn about their, uh, their law. What's been extraordinary in, in, um, in this project is it has brought to life the level of convergence between the lex arbitrary of most New York uh, Convention jurisdictions, uh, almost, almost giving to life the French transnational principles of international arbitration and, and have reflected uh, huge efforts at modernizing their own lex arbitrary throughout the world. And, and, and which also included the adoption of some variation of the ancestral model law. On your question, uh, beside, there is a near universal non-recognition of a right to a physical hearing. Uh, and, and, and also a near recognition of the modern view of a clear separation of rules of civil procedure, which may imply such a right to a physical hearing, and, um, what, and the lex arbitrary and the requirement involved by the lex arbitrary. And, and there is also a near universal recognition that a party who alleges it has a right to a physical hearing uh, must object during the proceedings to its violation or be deemed to have waived that right to, to seek a set aside or uh, non-recognition of the award. So to the opening questions of the survey on whether a right to physical hearing is expressly recognized or can be implied from, from the Lex Arbitrary or other rules, the vast majority of the countries said no. Uh, and in the last two installments of, of, the, of, the, of the reports public in, in, in March and May, none of the jurisdictions uh, surveyed uh, said that there is an express provision for the possibility of, of, of uh, um, prohibiting the possibility of conduct conducting remote hearings uh, subject to uh, certain fundamental procedural safeguards. There is, however, a small group of jurisdictions where the right to physical hearing could be inferred by way of interpretation. And you have, for example, Ecuador, uh, which uh, in in indicates that that right could be inferred from rules of civil procedures and Ecuador's constitutional guarantees. Germany is the same. Sweden, in Sweden, uh, the, re the reporters have taken a strong position which has been contested by many other Swedish commentators and practitioners that the right to a physical hearing must be inferred from Swedish law, drawing from principles, again, of procedural law. Um, important details, the authors of the report are also parties to a pending challenge they brought against an award on the basis of a violation of the right to a physical <laughs> hearing. <laughs> I don't know how do you say a uh, grain of salt in Swedish. Um, also in Venezuela, there is um, a right to a physical hearing that can be implied, but it is limited to the first hearing, which must be held physically, or at least not fully remotely. And in some jurisdictions, Benin, Norway, Tunisia, it, the right to a physical hearing may be inferred, but the, 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 the questions really remains unsettled. And by contrast, the word oral was removed from the consonic provisions uh, from the ancestral law in the Bulgarian Lex Arbitrary, thus confirming implicitly that the right to physical hearing can be excluded. Uh, in general, many statutes or laws expressly assign to the arbitrators the discretion to hold hearings, such as in the UAE. And going back to the model law, uh, this survey has unveiled really interesting articles, uh, uh, variations on Article 24.1 that, that Lucy was discussing, including um, uh, which, which, which provides that um, the arbitration shall hold an oral hearing if a party so requests. And whether such an oral hearing translates into a right to a physical one is once again excluded in most model law jurisdictions um, Argentina, Croatia, Iran, Ireland, Jamaica. In Zimbabwe, by contrast, the right to a physical hearing is arguably a right to, uh, 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 sorry, a right to an oral hearing is arguably a right to a physical hearing, considering the practical difficulties of conducting remote hearings because of simply unreliable and absent uh, 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 internet connections in, in the country. 
Um, interestingly, this problem does not exist in Thailand where the wording of the cor corresponding provisions in the Lex Arbitrary has been amended in such a way as to rule out the party's right to request a, a, a physical hearing. Um, the reports have shown, also shown an interesting nuances concerning the power of the arbitral tribunal to order uh, remote hearings despite the parties to hold a physical one. But first, all re most reports have, have stressed basically the tribunal's discretion to fashion uh, the, 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 the hearing, the proceedings in the, in the, in the way they deem fit, uh, so long as they are um, constrained by the requirement that they allow a party to present their case. Uh, and uh, which can be made without a hearing or can be made through a video conference. There's really two balancing considerations there for the tribunals is due process, uh, which requires, as, as Lucy was saying, sort of a case by case, fact specific, almost logistical uh, inquiry uh, of the party's ability to attend a, a, a hearing remotely and, and effectively present their case. And also considerations of access to justice and the duty to decide the disputes within a reasonable time, especially in jurisdictions where uh, Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights apply. Um, when the parties have agreed to a re remote hearing, can the tribunal ignore, override that agreement if they had agreed before the, the pandemic started and then there is simple impossibility of conducting the hearing uh, for, for two years uh, in, physically. Um, in most jurisdictions, holding a, re a hearing against the party's agreement could lead to setting aside of the award, Bangladesh, Benin, Dominican Republic, Finland, and I pass. Uh, this is also true in Portugal or France, but only provided that the party's agreement was made before the first arbitrator accepted his or her appointment. But this ground for setting aside is often qualified by the further requirement that the violation of the party's agreement has had a material impact on the outcome of the case or caused substantial injustice. Um, but also in many jurisdictions, the party's agreement can be superseded uh, on the grounds of fairness or efficiency if holding a physical hearing would no longer be possible due to COVID pandemic, as in Bulgaria, Bolivia, Hong Kong, or Mauritius. Or if, for example, respecting the party's agreement would delay the conclusion of the arbitration beyond the statutory limit, as the, is in the UAE, or violate the arbitrator's duty to conduct the proceedings without undue delay, as we were just, just discussing. Right. Uh, I'm good. I, could, I could go on. I love this project. Yes. <laughs> Great. And we will come back to it. But I thought I would ask uh, Chian, first of all, and then, and then Lucy, whether they thought uh, that, you know, given what Yasmin says to be a, a general trend uh, uh, of their, uh, as a result of the survey reports, do, do you, Chian, see a tendency of states, of governments uh, to legislate further to define what a physical hearing is? Um, perhaps you, Chian, first, and then we will come to Lucy's views. Yes, yeah, thank you. I'm, and I'm really pleased to be here and hearing the history of um, the right to physical hearing was something that I didn't know about. So thank you, Lucy, for doing that research and educating us on that. And Yasmin, congratulations to you for birthing this um, excellent report. I think it'll be hugely resourceful and um, I hope it gets the, um, the broad attention that it deserves. Um, in terms of states and governments um, looking at this and thinking about how to amend legislation in this regard, my sense is, um, based on most governments and what they've been dealing with during this pandemic, is there probably hasn't been that much attention paid to the amendment of this detail in either the Lex Arbitrary or the Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, what I have seen in certain jurisdictions are emergency orders that have been put in place to deal with the access to justice issues, in particular in relation to 
Um, I've seen in Australia do a, a project dealing with um, the Pacific Islands and gender-based violence and certain issues like that that require the kind of urgency to grant access to justice. And so when we're talking about commercial disputes in the context of international commercial arbitration, I haven't seen the kind of urgency that um, we in our community might think is needed for this. And frankly, I don't think it's needed for, given the conclusions that have been reached by the project. Um, and so um, whether we will ever see legislation amended to reflect you know, the right to physical hearing not being a requirement as I think um, as um, has been suggested is that I'm not sure we will need to see that. Um, I think it will be implied. I think that rules of institutions will deal with it as many have done. Um, I think one of the culprits in the assumption of right to physical in-person hearing was in fact the ICC old rules, which had some provision, I think it was Article 24 that required an in, that had the, the language of in-person, which was of course not intended to be taken literally, um, but was subsequently as a result of the pandemic um, clarified in a guidance note. And many other institutions have provided such further guidance in that regard. And so I think that the arbitration community has dealt with any potential need for amended legislation in, in this vein of, of um, the right to physical hearing. Great. So uh, the architecture is, is, is good enough to keep the building up, Lucy? Yes. Yes, it is, probably with a few exceptions. I agree with everything Chian just said. I think um, when there are fewer public health emergencies, maybe there will be an amendment to the model law. Uh, and follow on amendments to national legislation that uh, document or uh, legislate exactly what, what Yasmin was talking about, which is the, there is assumption that a hearing uh, in person or the ability to present your case can be remotely provided, uh, provided there is no um, bar of, of due process or equal treatment logistically. But that won't be as important as what the institutions are doing and actually what the, the hearing concierges are doing. I've seen cases where part of the protocol for the remote hearing is that hardware be provided uh, to and special hotspots be provided to those in countries and jurisdictions where it's uh, less reliable than it is here in my, well, actually I'm not really in the hearing room at Maxwell Chambers here in my, my living room. So we've got a lot of creativity. Uh, that's gone on that's undermining let's just say the illegitimate or the unwise protests by some parties that they absolutely cannot do uh, a remote hearing. I think we've rolled up our sleeves and dealt with it more practically than waiting for legislation. My other point will be arbitration will follow where the courts go uh, and courts in national jurisdictions in I can't speak for all, but in certainly all the major jurisdictions, they're doing everything remotely. So they'd be hard pressed to say they couldn't enforce an award uh, that followed a hearing that took place in person, but remotely. Great. Uh, I'm going to turn to you uh, now, Qian, uh, and, and say for the benefit of the audience uh, that Asia as a whole is still in economic development and the standards of power supply and electronic connectivity may vary from country to country. Is it fair, Jian, that the reasoning from a technologically advanced perspective that there is no right to a physical hearing is applied uniformly to all uh, countries or jurisdictions? Should tribunals take the position that general laws and general arbitration agreements in the way that we've discussed, the, the design of it, uh, they don't remove the power of the tribunal to recognize that the right to an oral physical hearing or, or the right to an oral hearing includes the right to a physical hearing in appropriate circumstances. What, what do you think? Yeah, thank you, um, Lawrence. And this is certainly a very relevant and topical issue even today as we continue to sit through the pandemic. Um, in Asia in particular, of course, um, 
technology will vary from country to countries. It covers half of the world's population. And so there will certainly be variants. Um, I wanted to take a look a little bit at that variance and look at some data that um, I have dug up from the many um, excellent international organizations that have over the years accumulated this information, including the World Bank data on power outages for one. Um, in a typical month, um, the power outages in Hong Kong, in, in, in Asia um, is actually not dramatic. Um, within the Asian countries, you'll see um, that Pakistan tops the list, but then Indonesia falls far below, um, much further behind. And so lo looking globally, when we look at, um, you'll, it, look, when you look at Asia, it is doing relatively well in the context of just power outages as a, a single data point. Um, but then looking at internet access accessibility and speed, um, this is where you will see greater variants. Um, in 19, 2019, um, we will see significant 48.8% um, of Asian population are internet users. So that's less than half, slightly less than half. In contrast with almost 80% in Americas, 82% in um, Europe. But of course, in contrast with Africa at 28%. Um, however, country to country within Asia, you, it differs widely. Now you look at um, Laos at 25%, and then yet on the other end of the spectrum, you have South, uh, South Korea at 97%, with China and India slightly in the middle at 70% and 56% um, respectively. And then you look at the connectivity itself, and there is similar variants. Um, Singapore connection speed tops the list um, at 242 megabytes per second with Thailand in third place, but then you have Vietnam at 61 megabytes per second and then India at 52. So there is more variance in terms of speed of connectivity. And finally, um, looking at the, oh, that was looking at connectivity, finally looking at speed, you have um, um, this is where the variance is the greatest, where you have South Korea again at the top with South Korea, Japan, and Singapore um, as the fastest wireless connected jurisdictions in, in Asia with other Asian jurisdictions trailing far behind, um, including Laos, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka at a slow 1.2%. And so giving you a sense of the kind of variance we're looking at in our region, um, you will see that some of the issues, the, some of the practical issues that um, Lucy and Yasmin alluded to can become real issues when engaging in a virtual hearing. Um, and so to answer your questions, I think the answer must be that, and I think it's not, wouldn't be true just in Asia, that, but everywhere in the world, that even if there is no right to physical hearing, paramount to international arbitration, as Lucy has um, written about and spoke about um, today, and also Yasmin, is still the right to due process, a fair process, and at the same time, an efficient process. And so how does this right to due process and efficient process manifest itself when there are parties or witnesses in less technologically advanced jurisdictions? Rather than the application the reasoning you alluded to without question. Um, in fact, the application should be that with many questions and questions early in the arbitral proceedings. When considering questions to ask and dealing with preliminary issues related to technology and the possible um, possibility of a fair hearing conducted without physically physical hearing, but focusing on due process, um, efficient process and the fact that there is um, oral hearing requested by the parties or, or as a matter of course, one barometer to might look one barometer to look at um, is the national courts. And again, Lucy had mentioned this and in that international arbitration will likely follow the national courts and or hopefully be ahead of many national courts. Um, and so looking at our region, what are the courts doing? 
um, perhaps one of the most high profile cases um, that I've seen has been the video hearing that was scheduled in March that was delayed by four months of Aung San Suu Kyi and President Win Mint's um, at the Nappy Dog Court. It is understood that the military regime had cut off all mobile data and some Wi-Fi services, um, but this ultimately prevented the oral hearing to or the oral hearing to happen by video conference until um, within one month ago. Um, taking a look at another example, um, Thailand and. Um, Yasmin had indicated that in the legislation, there is no um, specific right to um, a physical hearing. Um, and consistent with that, the um, remote hearings in Thailand have, um, in the courts, have been taking place since 2013. And due to COVID, um, the president of the Thai Supreme Court then instituted guidance to apply these. And so what they've done is a two-tier system for um, small claims disputes to happen by line, um, which is a brand of um, chat or video conferencing. Um, yes. Line applies um, of messaging. Yes, thank you. Um, and whereby if you have other civil law, um, um, more significant civil law, uh, civil cases, um, the parties can request to use Google Meet or Cisco WebEx. So there are different tiers and there has been thinking behind how um, courts can continue to conduct their hearings in that regard. And other jurisdictions have also taken this approach of allowing and instituting video conferencing during this period. And certainly there is no um, expectation that um, after COVID, whenever we see that, these courts will retract and go back to life as normal. The time, times have changed and indeed I think that change is here to stay. On the other hand, in, um, as of May this year in the Vietnam courts, um, they have temporarily suspended their courts direct receipt of petitions. And so in fact, they, there is no courts that are available um, without specific um, and special application. So it does vary within court to court. So it is important, um, as Lucy mentioned, to, to look at the courts. And I, I think that that is a barometer and an important factor for us to look at when we are considering um, whether the hearing should take place and um, ensuring um, due process and um, in balancing that against the efficiency of the process that we want. Um, uh, I'm going to put this question uh, to, to, to Lucy and, and to Yasmin and ask them to ask, answer it uh, from two different perspectives. Um, a party appears before a tribunal and says, uh, I want a physical, a physical hearing in a room because, for example, uh, what I intend to achieve in cross-examination won't be achieved by video conference or uh, I have a right to be in the same room as the tribunal to sense uh, the, the indications and the, tri and the inclinations of the tribunal. Uh, how would you, Lucy, uh, react from the perspective of uh, the tribunal? Well, from the perspective of an arbitrator, I have this, and I think others on this uh, program have as well, I've had this situation. And step one, I would ask the parties, but also research myself from the work that Yasmin and others have done uh, in the relevant jurisdiction to learn whether it, we, we can have, we have a clear path or at least an inferred path to the um, ability to proceed remotely even when one side says they don't want to do it or they can't do it. And then you get to the practical problems and there uh, we're developing, many of us are developing hearing protocols for remote hearings that uh, build in many protections, extra days so that if there are power outages uh, or something doesn't go well with someone's technology, including the arbitrator's technology, that we can reconvene uh, and continue setting standards for uh, what the connectivity has to be, helping parties who can't do it from home, say, or from their particular location to find a bigger city nearby. 
where there is an institution like a Maxwell Chambers or somewhere that can make provision to get decent uh, internet and set that all out um, in writing and make a fair decision on, on whether to go forward or postpone it to see what would, would happen. I don't buy in general any arguments that a, a remote cross-examination isn't good enough or that you can't read the faces of the arbitrators and you have some sort of right to know what the arbitrators are thinking, which sometimes is just, boy, I could use a coffee break. Um, I, I think those get, those get pruned out pretty quickly, but you start with the law. You start with what will happen to your award if you proceed. And then equally importantly, you look at fairness and equality of treatment. And going forward, I think we will see more hearings where the claimants team is physically together in one country the respondents team is physically together in one country. Witnesses, different, we can come back to that later. And the arbitrators ideally could be together in one room somewhere so they can converse and, and deliberate as they go. Yes, Bean? And muted. Um, as, as a general matter, uh, there, if the tribunal handles uh, the, the issue with a reasoned decision that reflects its consideration of considers the con concrete considerations of fairness in the case and explains why it, the, the, the decision made to conduct a remote hearing nevertheless protects the party's right to be heard, to present their case, um, and, and, and reject any sort of hyperbole like we've been hearing in the past 12 months about the essence of being in person to resolve a case, usually the courts will give great deference to the tribunal's determination. Uh, unless you're in the presence of a party's agreement to the contrary, um, the, the, the courts will not second guess that. We, I was, I was, because when it's not really a, a jurisdictional question that the courts will want to revisit applying their own law or that of the seat. Uh, if they see that a deliberation has been made by the tribunal and that what they have decided as is protective of the party's right to, uh, to, to be heard and they, they don't, um, no one has established that someone has been prejudiced by the, by the decision and that it had a negative impact on the, on, the, uh, on the outcome of the case, which is also often a requirement, the, the, the tribunal will uphold uh, the tribunal's decision on, on the issue, which means they, they will not uh, see this as a basis, as a ground uh, to set aside the, the hearing. Great. Uh The, Lucy, the, the arbitration world has responded very well to the challenges posed by the pandemic. Um, it has rediscovered its flexibility in procedures and informality and allowed hearings by video conference. Is there a risk, though, that in celebrating arbitration's ability to adapt, the community has equated a hearing with an oral hearing or a non-physical hearing and... and, and, and all of these things with a hearing by video conference. I mean, what, what I mean is that, you know, taken to its logical end, a non-physical hearing also includes a hearing by voice call without a visual facility, a hearing by exchange of live messages, Jian mentioned uh, line messages, for example, and a hearing uh, by exchange of documents only. What exactly is a non-physical hearing? Uh, so, multi-part question. Um, multi-part question. I don't see. Um, I don't see a risk that the arbitration community is going to go overboard going forward, away from sometimes having physical hearings or at least visual hearings into um, different formats. Um, I would just say, even though the U.S. Supreme Court does it, I think voice calls 
uh, while they might work well for preliminary sessions and certain meetings with the parties are the worst of all worlds because it's very hard to know who's talking uh, and there are no cues to be had ab about what how people are reacting and, and it's very hard to protect uh, on a voice call against um, tampering with witnesses who can of course easily be passed notes um, if, if counsel wanted. So voice calls I tend not to uh, not to look forward to. Um, visual, the visual conferences like we're doing right now are tiring for everyone. We know we have screen fatigue, but uh, it does keep you alert. The thing that interests me is that now with that we've gotten over this divide, these concerns from last year, and we're satisfied that in most cases, subject to the logistics we've been talking about and the laws that Yasmin has been talking about, um, it's generally accepted that a hearing, an oral hearing, can be done fairly uh, and equally. Um, what I see going forward post-pandemic or managed pandemic, I don't know what phrase to use, is that we will be using remote platforms uh, as preferable to physical meetings somewhere for pre-hearing conferences, first sessions at ICSID, oral argument where it's just the lawyers. And I'm sorry, there are not that many advocates who are so much more powerful in person that they're gonna sway a decision as compared to being in the room with them. Um, deliberations being online. Uh, and, and I'll mention this because I have a particular interest in this short non-critical witness cross-examinations being online in, the, in a physical hearing room. And why do I say this? Because we all know that remote hearings are saving time, they're saving money, they're saving wear and tear and jet lag on people, they're saving carbon, obviously, without everybody flying to some one spot in the world for a one-day hearing. Uh, and a really important point, and it's something that I've really enjoyed over the past year and a half, is the remote hearings allow so much more inclusivity of participants. I've had hearings where there have been, you know, 20 listeners from each party side. So I know that the young associates, even sometimes the paralegals, the, the people who supported the experts can listen in and see a hearing. It would never happen if everybody had to fly. Now, maybe we'll do that going forward for, for hearings that will have you know, streaming access. I'm not sure, but here's a big but. Having said that, most of us want to be back together and expect to be back together for evidentiary hearings. Uh, and some of that is it just works better to have the witnesses in the room. There is a difference. You, you do have a difference. Um, there's body language. There's an immediate conversation between the arbitrators. That's important that you can't do online in directing uh, the hearing. I don't think this means there's necessarily a, a better opportunity to present one's case to the level of affecting awards. Um, but I do think it makes a difference. Oh, and I forgot to say one thing. Uh, I've often thought about this because when I was a commissioner on the witness, the role of witnesses coming in uh, remotely, when I was a, an arbitrator on the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission, which was a humanitarian law commission following that civil war, that civil war between those countries, uh, we had hearings in the Peace Palace in The Hague uh, with many live witnesses, but at one point we needed the testimony from a surgeon. Uh, in Eritrea, who was very busy dealing with casualties and um, a, a busy surgical practice. And the questions really were not going to take more than one hour. So arrangements were made. This was back in, I don't know, 20, um, 2003 or four. So it took a little work to do the cross-examination by video conference and the uh, he didn't he didn't come out of a surgery to do it, but we were able to schedule it with minimal impact on his his important life and death work, and it satisfied all of us because the questioning was very short and specific. To me, it makes no sense. And I, you know, before the pandemic, I had a hearing where one witness was required, former ambassador, was required to sit in the hearing room for a week 
with the expectation that he might be called and would be called. And at the end of the day, he wasn't called. Uh, and so I think we'll be doing some, not triage, but just careful planning of how we do uh, witness testimony when we get back to physical hearings. And the last point I wanna say is, uh, we shouldn't forget there is a lot of creativity and bespoke um, planning for certain types of hearings. So for example, the World Intellectual Property Organization has long held the hearings uh, on its domain name disputes all online in writing back and forth because they're domain name disputes. Everybody's savvy. That's how uh, they do it. And um, maybe there'll be other types of hearings where we'll decide it's better online than, than offline. The, the key will be, I think, 3D video uh, technology as I Star Trek, Star Trek category of certain aspects of arbitration hearings. And then we'll have to have another conversation, uh, I think, at yeah. Maxwell Chambers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I'm going to put a similar question to you, Chian. I mean, we talked uh, earlier uh, about connectivity in the region. And you know, even leaving the, uh, the region and going globally, there can be connect connectivity issues between countries uh, who are participating in a video conference. We've discussed uh, what is the need for a case-by-case -case approach to how much physicality uh, there would be to a hearing. Uh, would, would that mean that, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis um, where the preferred choice of a video conference, as Lucy puts it, is not available, uh, the system will still tolerate, say, a voice call, a hearing by voice call or a hearing by, by live messaging? What do you think? Yeah, um, I mean, my similar immediate response is that uh, it's it's difficult, and I think it really depends, right? I think where we're what we're talking about is indeed a case by case basis, and what we're assuming here is that we have you know, two parties, one on each side. But what happens if we have multiple parties in multiple jurisdictions, and you have witnesses in Sri Lanka where there's 1.2 percent of you know internet speed? Um, and so I think that there will be times where you have to decide whether this witness is that important that, you know, we, we can't do that, uh, the, the cross-examination um, effectively um, without being by video. But there may be other witnesses where it's perfectly fine to go on phone. And so I do think it is case by case basis, but I think the important thing and the arbitration, the African Arbitration Academy has done a really good job of establishing a protocol early on because of the wholesale need for discussion about connectivity and about these other issues that many other jurisdictions don't have to face about how to early plan these potential issues. Um, and Lucy has alluded to the fact that you know, you plan these, you have these, each hearing will have its individual protocols, but I anticipate this will be par for the course where your PO1 or some at some stage, you will be talking about early planning on connectivity, on electricity if necessary, um, hardware, whether the institution has to be providing the, um, providing the hardware, software, types of software, so that, and even in the court systems, they have um, conversations with the telecom companies to try to, you know, tailor and um, make more efficient the connectivity for the purposes of access to the court. So I can see many of these discussions with early planning can help facilitate more um, access by video or, if necessary, by by um, by phone. Um, there is, you know, we were talking about, you know, the potential setting aside of um, awards that don't follow, you know, effective protocol. And there is, um, in fact, the pre-pandemic case coming from the English courts, Jiangsu Shangan um, Group versus Loki owning company, where the court did set aside an award um, on the basis that the witness didn't speak English and had an unreliable video link that um, may have led to the tribunal leading to a conclusion as to the witness 
And so that kind of case highlights the fact that, you know, the video conferencing technologies are used and it is, there must be a minimum quality threshold when dealing with this. And so it is a sensitive one. And I think as arbitrators, when you wear that hat, you have to be, be thinking about the end of the road. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I, I promised you we'd come back to the project again. And so fr from that perspective, I'm going to ask you, perhaps cheekily, that as much as uh, the arbitration world is thankful and appreciates the results of the survey, the overwhelming response uh, that there is no right to a, to a physical hearing might have the unintended consequence of hardening the view that there is actually a right to a non-physical hearing. What do you think? That's a... <clears throat> That's a question that many that many have raised, and um, that 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 may be the case. But I think the conclusion is that the the outcome of this um, of this survey, if there's really no right one way or another to uh, to 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 view and to approach the the, the issue, um, and there is one right is the right to be heard, the right to present your case. And however you get there is what matters. Uh, I was, I am heartened to see that uh, Chan's discussion about all the technical solutions have shown the, how far we've been. Uh, because of COVID, we've been asking between physical hearing and non-physical hearing about uh, the hardship of getting connectivity, et cetera. But is it easier to resolve a connectivity issue or is it easier to resolve a financial difficulty at getting or um, health difficulty at, at getting to another to another country and being in the same room as in others. There's the safety, the uh, immigration, the health issues. Um, and uh, so I think that this is a hot topic and I'm really happy that we're talking about this and I'm really happy that we're talking about the project. But the thinking about what is really at issue is going to evolve. And I think also uh, other considerations are going to have to be um, re uh, uh, rethought and re put again to the to the forefront of the of, of the of the discussion. And it's what um, Lucy was talking about: is that we will want evidentiary hearing in person, uh, physical, uh, not in person, uh, to avoid this sort of ambiguity. Uh, and, and Lucy was talking about sort of. The, the, her daughter's a classicist. And we go back to sort of the basic uh, rule of drama, unity of time, unity of place, unity of action. And it is very hard to achieve this sort of drama uh, of a hearing to the extent that this is what you're after, unless you are all in the same sort of bowl. Uh, and it's from the hearing, but it's also the hearing prep. Uh, you want to be with your client in the same conference room from 8 a.m. till midnight, eating the same food, eating the, the same food every night, and, 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 and preparing for that case with, with, this, with this level of intensity and commitment to your client. And um, you cannot do that when, when your client disconnects and, go back and goes back, or you go back to your, to your, uh, to your kitchen uh, and, 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 and do that. So... That's, so that's my sort of uh, long answer. And there is also one important point uh, for, the, for, for counsel is sort of what the clients expect from an arbitration. And, and very often when you have the smaller David client against the Goliath, the evidentiary hearing in the same room may be a, a very important equalizer. Uh, in the eyes of the client, the, the right to present their case is also the, in, the, the sensation that justice is being done and they have their case heard at the same level as the other side. We have a little bit of time uh, now to look at some of the questions and answers and, and some of them are, are, are comments. I will, I will read uh, them out. Uh, there was a question that asked whether there was a distinction between the right to an evidentiary hearing and a hearing for arguments only. Uh, perhaps we can start with Lucy. Do you think that, that there's any need to make that kind of distinction that there might be more physicality in one than the other? Yes, I, I think there's an obvious distinction, which is that when advocates 
present their argument. Um, sure, there are some points for style and impact, but there's, there's, in terms of the platform, one could read, I, I could read what the advocates are going to say. Whereas, um, and I'll come back to a footnote to that, whereas with witnesses being cross-examined uh, or, or questioned by the arbitrators, you don't know what they're going to say. That's not something that can as effectively be done in a, um, promoting truth and not so much truth, but accuracy um, in, in writing as compared to live. So I think there is a difference. But I don't want to underestimate the importance of oral hearings for advocacy as well, because I think we could all agree that although most lawyers don't, well, you're not supposed to add new points, of course, in your openings and your closings, the fact that you'll be in a hearing and you're going to have a limited amount of time focuses, requires you to focus on the most important parts of your case. It's a discipline to have to stand up or sit down and speak to the arbitrators to try to convince them that, that you will win. So um, I think we'll still have oral submissions on online, but it's different. It's different than the reality of questions uh, to witnesses and the ability to push them. And of course, even with the advocates, uh, the arbitrators wanna ask questions. They want they want to not necessarily interrupt, but to pursue it. And um, that can be done almost as well remotely, I think, um, as in person. But one thing I miss remotely is the ability to pass a note or whisper to a co-arbitrator or say, you know, what do you think about this? Shall we drop it? Shall we continue or take a break that's less obvious than having everybody go offline? Um, and I know Michael Huang is a big proponent of having um, the system that they use in China sometimes of having the opening statements being pre-recorded and watched at a convenient time zone by the arbitrators. Uh, I guess that works, but you still need, I would think you still need to get together and have the ability to question those advocates. And it's different to question at the end of a two hour recording and five minutes in when you say, well, I really don't understand that point, you know, Ms. So-and-so, could you elaborate? Here's one uh, for you, Yasmin. Uh, this uh, audience member hasn't had the chance to read all 77 reports, but was wondering whether there were any significant divergences between model law jurisdictions as opposed to common law, civil law. Between model law jurisdictions, did the editors see any uh, divergences? Um, that's... That that's an, not, that's an interesting question because, uh, yes, we have seen uh, some divergences, but nothing uh, uh, material. And it's really uh, what, how uh, oral in, the, in Article 24 translates in the model of jurisdictions, either in the statutes uh, it themselves or how they have been uh, interpreted. And uh, as I said, we have, uh, we have the, the whole uh, spectrum where uh, in Thailand, as I was saying, um, the, the, the provision is such that, uh, as a rule, there is no right to a hearing at all, uh, even though it's a, it's a model law jurisdiction. Um, in Zimbabwe, it's not the model law itself, but it's the way the, the, re the reality is. Um, you a right to a hearing means a right to a physical hearing, uh, unless you, you, you put other parties uh, elsewhere where they will have access to, to the necessary technology. And, and this may be easier to do than flying everyone uh, to, to the same place. Um, and, uh, but, but the framework of analysis and, and, and the outcome are really not that, that different between model law jurisdiction and it's also uh, a very interesting finding. Thank you. Chian, uh, one question that, that I thought you are uniquely equipped to answer uh, would be this one, uh, which, uh, where, where the audience member was very, very pleased to hear Lucy mention that even after COVID, uh, there should uh, be a, a considered use of uh, a physical hearing for reasons of uh, climate control, reducing emissions, for example. The question is that perhaps remote hearings and meetings could be the default and physical hearings the exception. 
Could this be implemented in the laws and rules to reduce objections on grounds of due process and equal opportunity? We, we discussed this a little bit early on when I asked whether you saw a trend perhaps in legislation, but the question now relates to whether uh, rules, even rules, arbitral rules, uh, can, can further define uh, the, a hearing and the need for its physicality. Yeah, that's a really interesting question and actually a great innovation. I think that it's a great idea to think about it, you know, put it on its head, put the default on its head and think about it in those terms. And certainly um, we've seen the expedited procedure rules um, within institutional rules work very well and they're on documents only as a default and question whether there are, might be another tier and I don't know what whether we would want to add any institution would actually want to add another tier but certainly within you know within the framework of an expedited kind of situation I could see that the default would be okay well you're not going to get that physical hearing unless you've you know unless you expressly agree to it but you might be able to get yourself to a, a physical uh, a, a video hearing um, and so I think the institutions should grapple with that question. Um, I don't know where they will end up. I would hope that um, there would be really, there would be, you know, thoughtful analysis on whether there is a need for physical hearing. Maybe one of the nuances will be, you know, if there are no witnesses, um, then the default is um, a vi video hearing. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about. Um, and, you know, the David and Goliath question, I think, though, was something that struck me that Yasmin mentioned. And that's something that I would, um, that would give pause to flipping that default on its head. Thanks. Here's an interesting question uh, that I'm going to pose to, to all of you, uh, starting with Lucy, Yasmin, and then uh, Qian. Uh, the member of the audience asks this question, should the IT expertise of arbitrators be taken into consideration when nominating or confirming the appointment of arbitrators? The lack of expertise may affect a, tribu a tribunal's ability to hold virtual or remote hearings. Lucy? That's a, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a very good question that is often asked um, diplomatically. Uh, as we prepare for remote hearings. Um, I, interesting <clears throat> question, sorry, <clears throat> whether um, that could start being asked on the uh, acceptance and declaration of independence, whether uh, an arbitrator is personally IT savvy, or I think importantly, has the support uh, available to him or her directly or indirectly to be able to participate. Um, there's more and more of a premium put on the hearing concierges, the hearing administrators, whether it's uh, at the, the venue or independently like arbitration place in Vancouver to assist the arbitrators. But no doubt about it, the arbitrators over a certain age who haven't been able to adjust over the past 16 or 17 months, um, the reputation is getting out there. Um, the reputation is getting out there that they're not doing well uh, on remote hearings. Yes, me. So that's the OK Boomer question to us. <laughs> I think that basically um, in important disputes, uh, and all disputes are important, that's probably not going to be a primary consideration. And good counsel, uh, they're one of their primary roles is sort of the empathy and knowing how to package a case, a presentation for everyone, and including holding hands of someone uh, who has, doesn't have the, the, tech, the tech savviness. And I think the question will be, would you be willing to uh, attend a, a hearing remotely? And I think the rest should be in the hands of the parties to pat and, and, and the arbitral institutions possibly to package a product that is easily accessible uh, to, 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 to any arbitrators of any generation. Chia? Yes, I think that um, I would tend to agree with Yasmin in that I don't think it will, it will be a deal breaker per se. 
Um, but I think it is a bit indicative of, you know, you, you have to continue learning. It's kind of like CPD points as an arbitrator. You have to kind of continue thinking, keeping up with the times. And so tech savviness, I think it's fair game to ask an arbitrator um, either at the declaration stage or at some earlier stage. Um, I do think the hearing concierges are getting excellent. And so it's great to be able to have access to them. But there will be a number of cases that are smaller that won't, won't be able to afford that or for one reason or another won't um, want to use an extra cost. And so in that regard, um, there may be um, an extra importance for the arbitrator that themselves to be um, him or herself to be um, tech savvy. Can I, can I, I want to add, Lawrence, if I can add, um, we all sound pretty skilled and blasé, but there is an element, if we're honest, an element of terror for arbitrators before every hearing that the primary responsibility on connectivity is on us and something could go wrong. Uh, I had a power outage in New York during a hearing in June. Um, I've, what happens if you forget to charge your computer uh, and then you've got a power out? This, it's a stress. It is a stress to want everything to go smoothly for the tribunal. Uh, and it's a stress, for example, I, one of my rules now in remote hearings is that the arbitrators all have to be in the breakout room before being put back into the main hearing room because I've had arbitrators who are relaxed about the length of their coffee break. In person, you can go grab them. You know, you can send someone into the men's room to get them. Uh, online, it's very embarrassing to be sitting there waiting for seven or eight minutes for an arbitrator to reappear. Um, we've got our own problems as, uh, as well as counsel. <laughs> One last question that I, I can't uh, resist putting uh, because I think it is, it, it is worthy uh, of being put to uh, the three of you um, is this question that has come in, uh, just come in. And the question is whether inability to ensure confidentiality creates uh, an issue or, or perhaps a differentiating factor towards uh, uh, in relation to a physical hearing and a non-physical hearing, perhaps Qian, Yasmin, and then Lucy with the last say. Um, yes, I certainly think that that's something that to be wary of and to have extra sensitivity towards the confidentiality aspect. But I think that there are ways to prevent this. You, you can sign confidentiality agreements. Um, when you have a witness, you can ask the sufficient questions that you need to ensure that that person is sitting alone and knows the rules of the game. So I don't think it's necessarily something that would you know, prompt me to think, well, of course, because we don't, that there's a threat or risk of um, um, losing confidentiality, we must go in, we must go in person or go physical. Um, so that's, that's my thinking on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree. Um, and if someone is intent on violating confidentiality in person or remotely is going to happen one way or another. I think the concern is about also hacking. And, uh, but that's also, um, that there's more exposure there because you're online, but I think it's going to be a matter of, to, uh, of securing the, the, the solutions for that. And then probably Lucy who's been arbitrating a lot since, uh, since COVID maybe it has some cues on how to deal with that. Well, I was going to say that's a very good question to end on because confidentiality was probably the first practical and logistical issue that we had to, besides that you have a computer, to deal with concerns about hacking, uh, about who could be listening in. And certainly the providers have increased their protections on confidentiality. Uh, in protocols now, we use things like a new password every day uh, a new password every session. It's a given that we have to worry about confidentiality. You know, 365 degree camera view of a witness. Um, a lot though is gonna remain the same honor system that we use in in-person hearings is that no one talks to a witness in a break of his or her testimony and people keep the proceedings 
to themselves. Um, one risk, it's something that um, certainly it affects diplomats and people in ministries of foreign affairs on trying to have classified phone conversations is you have to think about where people are sitting because when you're talking like, well, actually, I, you know, my son is making coffee in the kitchen. He can hear what I'm saying. So you, we, in protocols, we ask people to tell us that they will be in private places when we have uh, remote hearings for the risk of being overheard. I think rarely that's going to be market affecting uh, information, but some cases are more or less confidential. And I think my last point, if I may, to go back to one of your prior questions is, I think we'll start distinguishing between long hearings and short hearings. And the shorter a hearing is going to be, and the fewer witnesses there are going to be, the more there will be a tendency to try to do it remotely for environmental and um, efficiency reasons. And the longer they are with the more witnesses and the more difficulty with time zones, things like that, the more there'll be a presumption that, okay, we, we all have to get together. Uh, we'll be feeling our way into this going forward. And I think it's going to improve the practice. I think we've been forced to improve the practice just as video conferencing allowed us to do certain things and telephones allowed us to do certain things. But so mark my words, Lawrence, Star Trek, it's coming. And holograms. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this first Maxwell conversation where we, ex where we explore a different topic in international arbitration and challenge assumptions with a deeper examination of issues. Watch out for our next Maxwell conversation where we consider whether arbitrations in Asia will alter the fabric of international arbitration. Maxwell Chambers and I would like to thank our speakers, Lucy Reed, Yasmin Laklu, and Qian Bao. I wish you a good day from wherever you are watching. Goodbye.